scalability, this is something I have dealt with a ton personally. When, as I was building at Insider Viz and as I was sort of learning how to develop stuff, one thing that was constantly in my head was scalability. I was scared half to death of my app getting overloaded by requests or something and then getting a massive bill overnight and then just the whole thing crashing or whatever. So I have spent tons and tons of time researching and playing with scalability. So I kind of want to just talk about all the different types of scalability and how you can kind of solve when those how you can sort of solve for them. Some of them you want to just deal with as they come and some you want to deal with preemptively. So I'm going to talk about, which is probably the one that you're most interested in is going to be server scaling. So this is the one that whenever you hear see, whenever you see people talk about scaling, they're typically talking about server scaling. And the typical, there are really two solutions for this that exist. And the first one of course is going to be the traditional uh, K8s and Docker. So Kubernetes with Docker containers, which is, if you're not familiar with how this works, effectively how it is, is a Docker image is a container. So you can imagine your app exists within that container. And that app has its own resources, its own CPU, and it can handle X number of requests at a given, at a certain moment in time. So you could have a little node container that can handle a thousand requests a second, but then if it breaks that thousand request threshold, that container is going to start to crash because it's going to get overloaded. So what this will do, what this auto scaling Kubernetes thing will do is it will add more containers. So it'll automatically add out more containers. So it'll grow as you get requests. So it'll sort of just grow your app, um, scale up your containers as you need them. But then as soon as you no longer need them, it'll scale them back down. So it's that sort of auto scaling technique. And that's something that Heroku will do for you. That's something that a lot of these cloud providers do under the hood, but the general concept is traditionally done with Docker and Kubernetes, but that has sort of been replaced these days with serverless. Serverless has become very, very popular. It started with AWS Lambdas, I believe might have started with something else but that was one of the first big implementations and now tons and tons of different things have been built on top of it we now have serverless databases with planet scale we have serverless app hosting providers like vercel it really does make a huge difference in your app and if you're not familiar with what if you're not familiar with what serverless is effectively what serverless is is so in the docker example we had a container that so you have that container it's spun up and it's running in the cloud so that little instance is just going to keep running in the cloud keep going keep serving requests serverless is different when you spin up a serverless instance, nothing is actually getting spun up. All it's going to do is just sniff out those requests. And then if you make a request to a serverless instance, it's going to spin up an instance that will then handle that request. Then that instance will spin down as soon as it's done with that request. So it re it results in you having A, your serverless stateless. So you can't have anything that you need to keep persisting on your server. So you couldn't have like an internal counter that's only being stored in your server's memory or whatever, because that'll get wiped because every time you're, you finish a request, or every time you send out a response, your server is going to spin down. So serverless, basically what it, that means is if you think about how that would really work, if you had 10 billion requests come into your app all at once, it's a silly number, but imagine you did, then your entire app would just instantly scale to meet that because all of these instances would instantly get spun up and then all spun down and they wouldn't bottleneck each other. So it creates basically just infinite auto scaling. And it also creates a really predictable pl pricing plan where you just pay for the serverless instance that you use. So if you're not running any servers, you're not incurring any billing. And then if you do have to run those instances, you only pay for when they're spun up and running. So it makes the serverless instance very cost effective, very easy to work with. And at this point, like my best, my recommendation for if you're trying, if you're worried about scaling and you want to make sure that your app is uh, future proofed, just build it in a serverless architecture. Use a serverless database like PlanetScale. Use a serverless hosting provider like Vercel. Host your external functions in Lambdas, that sort of thing. That's going to basically lead to a good peace of mind of where you're only going to be scaling up when you need to. The sort of last thing you can do to combat server scaling, and this is a sort of more, this is not the typical approach you would hear, but I think that this is a way to handle it because this is a way I actually handle scaling on Insider Viz. So Insider Viz, we have to send out huge payloads of data and serverless would solve this problem. But the problem is we're going to have to send out massive amounts of data and do massive amounts of compute on every single serverless request, which is going to incur the billing regardless, because even though, yeah, we don't have to worry about constantly having it up and running. If you have enough users, you have to send out all that data and you have to compute all of it. It's not going to be much better. So what we did to combat this is we leveraged static building. So Next.js allows you to static build pages and we have it so that every 20 minutes, all of our pages are, are static built. 
So that means that they do one request to our server, then they static build all the data, and then that data is cached into a CDN, which is a content delivery network, which basically just means the content is put out across the world so that whenever an end user requests it, it's sent to them from the closest data center. So they request that data, it gets there super quickly, and it doesn't incur any cost on our server. So we have to do all the requests and the data fetching once every 20 minutes, which in the grand scheme of things is like nothing. So our server bills are virtually zero on Insider Base. We could scale up to hundreds of thousands of users overnight and we wouldn't even see it happen on our bills because it's architected in an intelligent way so that we could leverage the fact that we only need to build this data every so often. So we static build all that data and then send it down. Now this isn't a feasible solution for every use case. You couldn't build a social media app like this because you need to constantly fetch new data. But in our case, when we have static data, you can get around that. So if you have a use case where you can leverage static data, do it because it's the cheapest and easiest way to bypass any server scaling needs you have. So the next thing is going to be cost scaling. Cost scaling is something that will kind of creep up on you later. And it's something that a lot of these SaaS products have sort of built into them so that as you grow your app, your costs are not going to scale linearly. They're going to sort of scale exponentially. So what I mean by that is if you've ever used something like Firebase, Auth0, Vercel, any of these platforms, these have really great, really generous free tiers. They want you to build your app on their platform on the free tier, no problem whatsoever. But then as your app scales up, this co the cost is going to scale up as well. Because suddenly you're going to break that free tier and you're going to start needing to actually pay for it. And a good example of this is Firebase. Firebase has an extremely generous, extremely nice free tier, but as soon as you start scaling, as soon as you start growing, your cost is going to start to scale rapidly because Firebase gets pretty expensive. So you get that sort of cost scaling thing that starts to appear, and this is a pretty hard thing to combat because it's something that, like, if you've architected your app, entire app around a certain service or whatever, you can't really just flip overnight to, okay, we're going to go to a more cost-effective solution. This is sort of something that you kind of have to weigh as a business decision. So... Cost scaling is borderline inevitable. Obviously, as you grow, you're going to have more costs. Like, servers cost money. There's no way around that. But you can make intelligent decisions so that as they scale, they don't hit you as hard as they could for something else. But you got to weigh that with the trade-offs. So if you went and you fully custom built out your own low-level architecture in a super efficient language like Rust or Go or whatever, hosted on serverless environments and then deployed everything to the edge and all that stuff, did all the fancy buzzwords, yeah, you would get your costs really low. But you also have to think about the dev time that would go into that. That could potentially take months or even years to get fully perfected versus if you just use an out-of-the-box solution like an Auth0, a Firebase, something like that with a really generous free tier that has a super great developer experience you could get your app up and running within a month and then suddenly yeah your cost is going to scale but it's only scaling because your users are scaling so you're making money but you're also spending money versus the other you're still in the architecting stage because it's so freaking complicated what you're trying to build so you have to weigh these sort of pros and cons and a lot of companies when they get to huge like scale or whatever they end up going back and building their own custom architectures and stuff but they start out with something else and i think that's the sort of thing i want to say is for cost scaling, it's inevitable. It sucks, but it's inevitable. And I think you should worry more about building your stuff and just accept that if you're building something good and it's scaling and people are looking at it and using it, that probably means that it's going to be making money. And that's a good thing. So having a server bill isn't the worst thing in the world if you've got end users who are paying you for your product. I guess the next thing I'll talk about is team scaling. Team scaling is something that you're really not going to see for a while, and especially if you're just a start you're a younger dev or whatever and you're starting to build out your projects you're not going to have this until you're really established but it is something that you're even going to notice when you bring on like one or two more people because i can tell you from experience that managing a project even with more like two people on it it gets trickier than you think and obviously this is one of those things where the complexity like the team scaling you can scale your team in a very you can scale your team a lot. If your team really starts scaling up, then yeah, you need to get DevOps engineers to handle CICD, all that stuff, which if you're not familiar with what DevOps is, it's basically just a fancy term for developer optimization. And basically it's like these CICD workflows, which are effectively whenever you make a commit or you do something, it'll automatically trigger a workflow to help handle that. So instead of every time you push something up to GitHub and you want to deploy it to a test branch, you have to go and manually do all that, it'll automatically do that for you. Or if you need to check whether or not you can put something in the main, you don't have to manually like check against it. You can do like merge checks and all that stuff. So it'll handle a lot of these like mundane tasks for you and it'll do a lot of your testing for you. 
So there are entire fields of people who literally their entire job is to just do that. They optimize the developer experience at their company or their workplace or whatever. I am not a DevOps engineer. This is probably, if you are, you probably hate the butchered summary I just gave of it, but the general idea is they optimize the workflow. So that's a way you can scale your team is by optimizing your workflow. And then another way is you just gotta manage your team. And this is kind of a mundane, dumb thing, but it's something that you realize pretty quickly when your project gets big enough is you gotta actually manage what you're building and what you're doing and where you're going with it. So that's where stuff like these project management boards come in. And again, I am the furthest thing in the world from an expert on this. My friends and I have a very great system built out of we just kind of do things and then it's like, oh, hey, that's a cool thing you did. And then we just throw it together. It's not good. I don't recommend it, but it works for us and as we scale i can tell you for a fact we're going to have to end up implementing something like this but not entirely certain how that's going to look like but i think it's worth mentioning that team scaling is a real thing it's something that you will have to deal with someday but more than likely if you're at the point of team scaling you're doing pretty well and you're hiring people so life's pretty good finally we have complexity scaling so complexity scaling is i think probably the most slept on thing on here but i think it's one of the most important things it's something that a lot of people just don't take into account at the onset of a project and it leads to them making some really bad architectural decisions that incur absurd amounts of technical debt so the example i put on here is um javascript to typescript this is it's not really an issue anymore because the whole world has kind of just agreed, okay, fine, we're all use TypeScript now. I really don't see anyone unironically using JS anymore. But, you know, five years ago, this was a thing where people were still pretty reluctant to move over to TypeScript. I remember seeing videos when I was in high school of people, like, coming around to TypeScript and then the TypeScript caught, like, the defending TypeScript stuff and all that. So, effectively, what that was about is the JavaScript it's really nice and it's quick because you don't have to worry about the types and everyone didn't like it at first didn't like typescript at first it's like oh this is going to slow me down i don't like these types i don't like all these annoying extra things i have to do it yells at me for dumb things and it basically what that's doing is that's a safeguard that's going to help you scale via complexity because your data model of my database has like four tables and each table has like six entries in it that's pretty easy you can kind of manage that in your head with JavaScript is not perfect, but you can handle it. But then if you suddenly, but then suddenly if you need a more complex model, and I can tell you for a fact, even the most simple app, even a to-do app that you actually tried to ship to have real features with it, it's going to have a very complex and very large data model. These Prisma schema files and all that stuff, they are going to be hundreds of lines long, if not thousands, because there is so much data in there. And keeping track of that in your head is not scalable. The JavaScript is not going to scale to it, but TypeScript will because you're gonna get this IntelliSense built in there. So you have to sort of think about that complexity scaling ahead of time where, okay, today I can handle this in JS, but could I handle this in JS tomorrow? Probably not, I need the types of TypeScript. And then the second example I sort of give is the monolith to microservices architecture pattern. This is something that you are not going to hit until you hit absurd scale. This is something that massive companies do when they have teams of like 500 developers working on one code base and they're finally like, all right, enough is enough. We need to break this out. This is not something that you do ahead of time. And this is also, it's more on here to caution you that you don't do this at the start because you don't know what your app is going to be. I can tell you from experience, I thought I was being smart and I tried to do this on one of the versions of Insider Viz and then I quickly realized that I just didn't actually know where Insider Viz was going. It's great if you have a pre-built app and you can take this already existing architecture and you can spread it out into these different little services or whatever. You can say, okay, I have a strong authentication service. I know what it does. I can write the contracts. It makes sense. So you have that layer and it's like, all right, fine. So we can break out that authentication, then we can break out the cart, then we can break out the storage, we can break out the photos. Okay, all of that works. But what happens at the start when you don't really know what all of that is? Projects start foggy. Even client work where they sort of they say they know what they know, they really don't. It's the deliverables change, and that's just how it works. And you need to be more agile at the start. And microservices suck to manage and get set up. There's I think conceptually i love them i think that they are an amazing concept and i love the idea behind them but i tried to implement them one time and it was miserable i had to have i had like sick i had a mono repo of like six go projects each like handling a different service and i had to like spin them all up at once and then i had to manage the envs of all of them and then when i went to host them i had to host them six different times or i had to set up a ci cd which would do something six times over and manage all this crap and it got so unbearable so fast that i'm like yeah this is not worth it at the start 
you need to stay in a monolith at the start. And that's sort of what I'm trying to say too with the complexity is you have to weigh, or really I think that's what I'm trying to say with all of this, is you have to weigh the pros and the cons of prepping for scalability because on the one hand, you have like the language scalability. You gotta to wanna to make sure that you're able to scale to add more complex features, but you also don't wanna do so at the expense of being able to make said features. It's a very delicate balancing at that. Really, you only kind of figure out with time. A good rule of thumb for like common stuff is always gonna be like, you know, it's 2022. We all know you use TypeScript. This is how it works, use TypeScript. And then for like the microservices question, start with a monolith. Don't worry about that until you're at absurd scale and you've got someone who can come in and directly architect that for you. So I guess the central thing I'm trying to say with all this scaling stuff is there's no one size fits all for everything. But the, the best thing you can do to handle this is to sort of try and just think ahead. Think ahead about what can you do today to help incur as little technical debt for tomorrow as possible. Technical debt is not an inherently bad thing. If you can use an out-of-the-box solution that's slightly suboptimal, but it'll get you in production four months earlier, that's probably worth it. But if it's something that's like, eh, it's more annoying, it's gonna take slightly longer, but it's going to, it'll only delay you by like a day, but it's gonna save you tons of scaling and server costs and all that stuff, then it's worth it. I think TypeScript is a great example of that. Yeah, it's a little bit of a nuisance to learn. At least it was back in the day, because most people are learning on it now, but before when everyone just knew JavaScript, that was a bit of a nuisance to get used to the types and get used to how it actually worked in comparison to just old JS, but the di but it paid off in the end because we ended up having this language that can actually be used in big projects to where I can go in and I can pull down my requests from where I can make a database call via Prisma and I can get this object back and I can know what it means. I can see, okay, I have these fields or I can import a package and I can see what it has on it. TypeScript is so integral to the developer experience these days that it's something that you can't skip. But there's something like microservices where you can skip it. It's not integral to your developer. It's not integral to your developing. And even though, yeah, technically years down the line, it could end up being a liability where you have this giant code base at it's not going to be an issue for so long and it's going to be such a hindrance now. So really just think about how much of a hindrance is it going to be today and how much of a hindrance is it going to be tomorrow and then weigh the two against each other.